There are few places in the solar system which are as fascinating as Saturn's moon Titan. It's a world with a thicker atmosphere than Earth, where it's so cold that it rains ammonia forming lakes, rivers, and seas, where water ice forms mountains. Like Europa and Enceladus, Titan could have an interior ocean of liquid water too, a place where there might be life. Titan's got layers, and fortunately there's an awesome new mission in the works to explore it, the Titan Dragonfly Mission. For the longest time, astronomers didn't know how special Titan was. That's because the Saturnian moon is cloaked in thick clouds that obscure a view to its surface. In fact, for the longest time, astronomers thought that Titan was the largest moon in the solar system, since they couldn't tell where the atmosphere ended and the ground started. Now we know that Ganymede is a little bigger. The first spacecraft to visit Titan was Pioneer 11 in 1979. It couldn't see through the thick clouds, and neither could the twin Voyager spacecraft, which followed in 1980 and 81. They did gather additional clues about Titan, though, detecting traces of hydrocarbons in the atmosphere, like acetylene, ethane, and propane. Most of its atmosphere, however, is nitrogen, just like Earth. With an atmosphere filled with nitrogen and containing hydrocarbons, this sounds like a potential spot to find life. Maybe even life that uses an entirely different biology than Earth life. How habitable is Titan? It wasn't until NASA's Cassini spacecraft made the long journey to Saturn and went into orbit around the ringed planet in 2004 that the instruments were finally in place to peer through Titan's cloaking atmosphere. Over the course of its 13-year mission at Saturn, Cassini flew past Titan 127 times, using radar and infrared instruments to see through the haze and reveal features on the surface of Titan. Cassini saw clouds of hydrocarbons, which rain hydrocarbons into hydrocarbon rivers, collecting into hydrocarbon lakes and seas. My point is, hydrocarbons. Cassini also dropped off the European Space Agency's Huygens lander, which parachuted down through the atmosphere, recording its entire two and a half hour journey. It landed on the surface and sent back the first ever images from the ground on Titan. Between them, Cassini and Huygens revealed that Titan is covered with organic molecules in the kind of state that was thought to exist here on Earth four billion years ago. The problem, of course, is that Titan is incredibly cold. That's how you get all those liquid hydrocarbons I was going on and on about. The surface temperature is minus 179 Celsius or minus 209 degrees Fahrenheit. Just for comparison, the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth is about minus 92 Celsius or minus 133 Fahrenheit. The thick nitrogen atmosphere on Titan means that you wouldn't need a spacesuit if you wanted to walk outside on Titan. Just a really really thick coat. So if you've got all these raw materials for life on the surface in a fairly thick nitrogen atmosphere with liquid hydrocarbons acting like a solvent and swirling chemicals around, there's even ultraviolet radiation from the sun breaking up chemicals and encouraging new chemical reactions with hydrogen, methane, and nitrogen. But then you've got a brutally cold environment, completely hostile to life on the surface. The good news is that Titan seems to have a liquid ocean between its icy surface, just like Jupiter's Europa and Saturn's Enceladus. This was confirmed by careful gravity measurements made by Cassini during those 137 flybys. The difference is that Titan has all the building blocks of life on the surface layer surrounding the ocean. See how this is ideal? At NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a group of scientists are trying to figure out how likely it might be for life in Titan's oceans. Between now and 2023, they're hoping to work out the conditions that could allow organic molecules to move from the surface of the world down into its interior oceans, the perfect habitable environment. And the effort is called Habitability of Hydrocarbon Worlds, Titan and Beyond. Their first objective is to figure out how organic molecules might move around the planet and be transported from the atmosphere to the surface and then into the subsurface ocean. 
Some of this work has already been done using observations from the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile to study the atmosphere of Titan and measure its chemical content. Even though Cassini was much closer and did some of these observations, ALMA is actually much more sensitive to the kinds of molecules floating in Titan's atmosphere. The observatory has been able to detect changes in levels in Titan as methane and molecular nitrogen are broken up by the sun's ultraviolet radiation. It's possible these organic molecules might be able to seep down into the ocean. Or maybe the organic molecules are generated from inside Titan itself and make their way up and out through the cryovolcanoes on the surface. It's probably impossible to directly sample the subsurface ocean in the near future, but if hints are found on the surface, a heated probe like the mission proposed for Europa could melt down through the ice and reach the ocean. And we've done a whole episode on this idea, and I'll put a link here and in the show notes. Then, they want to understand whether these subsurface oceans might actually be habitable, and if they are, what kinds of life might be down there. Even though there's a liquid ocean, we don't know if it has enough of the right chemicals and energy for life to survive. One example of Earth life that could point the way is called Palobacter acetylenaeus, which feeds off the acetylene for energy and carbon. The researchers plan to simulate Titan's environment and see how well this bacteria can survive. Finally, is there some way for life to be transported back out of the oceans and onto the surface of Titan where it could be studied up close? Even though the ice shell on Titan might be 50 to 80 kilometers thick, there could be geologic processes over millions of years that could bring material from the ocean to the surface. In order to gather that data, you'd need some kind of robotic mission that could move rapidly across the surface of Titan, sampling different locations to search for evidence of life. You know what would help? Some kind of nuclear-powered Titan helicopter. And we'll get to that in a second, but first I'd like to thank Space Jamie, Tony Principe, John Duff, Ron Stowe, and the rest of our 792 patrons for their generous support. They contribute so that you can see these videos and we can make them freely available to anyone who wants to learn about space. And thanks to the support of our patrons, we've decided to do a bunch of bonus episodes for the next couple of months. Two Guide to Space videos a week instead of just one. Thanks, patrons. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today and get in on the action. Titan is absolutely fascinating, and we really, really need to send a mission back to study it in more depth. And I'm happy to announce that NASA has officially chosen a nuclear battery-powered helicopter that will be off to Titan in 2026. It's called Dragonfly, and you might be familiar with it because of a collaboration I did with Everyday Astronaut last year. NASA was trying to choose between Dragonfly and a comet sample return mission. Although I wish both missions could fly, this would absolutely be my choice too. The conditions on Titan are perfect for a flying machine. The atmospheric density is four times higher than Earth, while at the same time, the gravity is lower. Flying on Titan is kind of like swimming in the oceans of Earth. You could strap on a pair of wings on your arms and fly around on Titan, which seriously, I would love to try. Dragonfly will be equipped with a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator, the same kind of plutonium battery that powers Mars Curiosity, Mars 2020, and many of the probes in the outer solar system. As the plutonium decays, a thermocouple converts the heat to electricity to power the spacecraft. And Dragonfly will be able to generate enough electricity with its RTG to fly in the titanium atmosphere, making longer and longer hops at about 8 kilometers at a time. For its primary mission, it's expected to fly 175 kilometers, double the distance of all the Mars rovers combined. The mission is expected to launch in 2026, taking about 8 years to get to Titan, arriving in 2034. NASA has chosen the Shangri-La dune fields near the equator as the landing site, a place that's similar to the sand dunes in Namibia. It'll jump from region to region, sniffing and sampling the environment around it until it gets to the Selk Impact Crater. This is a place that seems to have evidence of past liquid water and organic molecules. This is exactly the kind of place where there could be evidence of water that escaped from Titan's interior to its surface. In other words, 
This is where we might find that Titan once had, or still has, life in its interior ocean. There have been a few other ideas to explore Titan, including a submarine that could explore hydrocarbon lakes, and various boat ideas, and even a sailboat. We've done a whole episode about other potential missions to Titan, and I'll put a link here and in the show notes so you can watch that. Titan! We're going back to Titan, and this time, we're sending a helicopter to explore this fascinating world in detail. At the same time, astronomers and planetary scientists will be building up the case for life, either today or in the ancient past, and how it could move from the surface of its interior oceans and vice versa. And this could help us understand how life could have gotten going here on Earth. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links so that you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. And finally, here's a playlist.